Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I'm going to try that one more time. Good evening. My name is Joel Lohr. I have the distinct honor and privilege of serving as the 11th president of what is now Hartford International University for Religion and Peace, known to many of you also as Hartford Seminary in the past, Hartford Seminary Foundation, or if you were around in 1834, the Theological Institute of Connecticut. Um, we've had a few names in our day, and we are now Hartford International University, and very proud of that title. We are for religion and peace. And if you know anything about this institution, we are an institution of firsts. We're so proud of them. The first one that always comes to mind is way back in 1889, this institution decided that it should admit women. The first seminary in the country to admit women. Be proud of that. I wish I printed it, Susan. Just uh, yesterday, David Grafton shared a dedication of the McKenzie Building uh, to our, if you look at the Yukon Law School, next to us, there's a dedication of one of the buildings there. And even back then in 1923, where's David Grafton? He's here. Was it 1923 that the building? 22. It included the most lovely and beautiful languages about supporting all people of all faiths. I mean, how incredibly be beautiful is that? Way back then, that this was a place in its inception to support Muslims, Christians, Jews, and to this day we live out that mission. It's a beautiful place to be. I hope that you are getting to know a student at your table. This was intentional. You get to meet a Master of Arts in Peace Building student. Uh, you are going to meet them tonight. So tonight we are here to recognize those who have supported the program. So first I'd like to acknowledge our trustees and ambassadors. If you are a trustee or ambassador, could you raise your hand and wave to us? Hello, thank you. If you are a former trustee or ambassador, could you also be recognized? Hello, thank you. I think all of you will have to put up your hands because this is a donor appreciation event. How many of you are supporters here tonight? Uh, donors, yes, hello, thank you. And we, our students, just so you can be recognized, I think most of you are because you're maybe a little younger than the rest of you, maybe not. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> students, could you please raise your hands and be recognized as well? So tonight we're here to celebrate our students. As I remind our faculty, staff, I don't need to remind them, we are here because of students. They are our mission. They are what gets me out of bed in the morning. They're why I fundraise and why we're here tonight. So we're gonna learn more and celebrate our students. Hopefully you will be informed about the program that they are in, the Master of Arts in Peacebuilding program. And as well, I hope you leave here inspired. If you don't leave inspired, I, I mean, I feel like, should I give a guarantee? Um, <laughs> I won't do that, but I do think you will be inspired tonight. We have a full program. I believe there's a program in front of you, and I think my next order of business is to introduce our first speaker. Um, we have representatives from a, an important group out of New Jersey, Princeton, New Jersey, called Fellowship in Prayer. And Fellowship in Prayer has been very generous with this program, and I'd like to invite David Newton, the chair of the board, to say a few words and explain the awards they're giving out tonight or unless Ephraim Isaac, would you both like to come up, Dr. Isaac? The Father of Peace, is, I just need to say this about the Father of Peace. So I was, um, Dr. Isaac, who is distinctive here because of his Ethiopian garb, uh, he has won awards for his uh, work in peace building and the story that I have to tell you, he, the, the students are nodding along because he teaches in the program as well. When I was in Denver for a conference, I was in a cab and the cab driver, uh, I, you know, I like to make small talk and I said, oh, you're from Ethiopia. Um, how long have you been here? Oh, about 15 years. And then I, I mentioned that I know an Ethiopian uh, diplomat who's done a lot of peace building in Ethiopia, and I said his name is uh, Ephraim Isaac. And he said, oh, the father of peace. I know him. Yes, you know him? <laughs> so well, there I was, way out in Denver, and he knew you, and he was proud of your work in Ethiopia. So it's an honor. Can we recognize you for being here tonight? Thank you, Dr. Isaac. <laughs> David. Thank you, Joe. Um, Last year, actually, while well, we're talking about garb, uh, my name's David Newton, I live in Princeton, New Jersey, and um, um, Dr. Isaac very nicely put me on the board a number of years ago of Fellowship in Prayer, which 
started off in 1949 as, a, um, as an organization that tried to coordinate prayer as an answer to nuclear proliferation. And all I can say about it is, is that it's, it seemed to have worked fairly well up until now. And, um, but then um, it turned into a publication society and uh, it was, what it happened to be in New York and um, was, for want of a better expression, it was sent out to pasture to uh, Princeton, New Jersey. And for about 30 years, it was a, a publication society, very critically well, critically well received um, journal called um, Sacred Journey, which came out around quarterly. Um, but we, we found that, that even with the quality of journalism, um, we weren't being read by a very wide audience. And in 2013, um, even though I wrote, I wrote fairly often for the, um, and, and Ephraim did also, um, we decided to close the, the publication. Um, we were very lucky to have received a gift many years beforehand from Mrs. Eli Lilly. And so we had um, a sum of money, um, an endowment, a small endowment to work with. And we converted the organizations into a, a grant-making organization. Um, Evrayim and I remained on the board um, along with a couple of other directors. And one of my directors, um, or my fellow directors, a man called Reverend Wayne Mizell, who um, is not with us tonight, but Wayne um, decided that he should uh, uh, design a mission for us. And the mission really became about scholarship, about peace building. Um, help me here, Evrayim. Um, about um, about working with with our, our local community and um, the, the the last thing being about leadership and the way we've worked best is we, we've joined forces with like Interfaith America and with the Hartford International University to create a series of, to create with them a partnership or a series of partnerships whereby um, we donate a sum of money and that money is used to hopefully benefit or promote um, um, young leaders um, who are, are graduating or who are with that, those organizations. Uh, and that's where we are. This is our second year doing so, and Joel, thank you very, very much. And your graciousness is always greatly appreciated, and it's been nice working with Katie. And, um, you know, and we really, to, I'm humbled to be here as part of um, this graduation, and we, we particularly um, are very proud of the graduates, and um, we look forward to working with you. And I'm going to hand over the microphone for just a couple of minutes to Ephraim, and um, you may say a couple of words. Thank you. Is the end to you? It's a great pleasure to be here again. And I have had a wonderful visit to this campus. And uh, President Joel uh, has been very kind to me and the staff and the craftsmen and others. Um, and I was looking forward actually to this occasion this past year because uh, I really, with all due humility, had a great year where I've been honored in many different ways, including by Harvard University as one of the alumni who had made a difference. And uh, I think I sent you a copy of the story. So I was thriving on that. And then about a month ago, I had a little pain in my stomach. And uh, I went to the hospital. And they decided, um, well, uh, it's, it's better if we take your append appendix out. Well, I didn't like the idea, but I agreed. And which meant I had to stay in the hospital four days. and. Uh, become very, very tired and sleepy. In fact, you can see me. But let me just say a couple of words regarding that experience and my whole experience of what's happening in the world today. Uh, President Joel kindly referred uh, to Ethiopian guy who calls me. That is the name they gave me in Ethiopia. <laughs> Kids on the street, whenever I go, they say, father of peace. I don't know why they call me father of peace. I could be mother of peace too. Um, but um, uh, the truth of the matter is, uh, from my elementary school days, I've always believed in peace. 
I used to, to jump in between students who used to fight with each other. And uh, going back about 35 years, I founded the Ethiopian Peace Organization. And uh, peace had always been very central in, in, my, in, in my life. Now, this experience, which uh, I have this year, uh, of course, very gratifying. Then when I got sick, and then when I heard about the war in Ethiopia, in which almost a million people died, I started looking at the problem of human nature. And I can give a long lecture another time. But in summary, let me say this. As it says in Psalms of David in the beginning, you know, there are the two ways, the way of the wicked and the way of the righteous. And how true it is for me this year. In Ethiopia, my beloved country, a war broke out in which a million people were killed. I couldn't sleep over this. I have written several articles published in the Ethiopian newspaper, and I said, who are these people? And not only that, many of the soldiers were raping women, damaging their bodies. It's unbelievable. Then I come to the hospital. And all of a sudden, I see these nurses taking care of me like a baby. Even helping me with my clothing, touching my body. I said, are you women or angels? Indeed, I must say, it's really created in my mind, my optimistic view, that there are good human beings. I cannot forget, it's not one woman, it's one nurse and two nurses, several of them. They touch you everywhere without thinking of any kind of emotion. They will take care of uh, your urine, <laughs> if I can even say that. <laughs> Who are these people, really? Really, I cannot still think of them as just simple women, but as really, truly angelic people. And that created faith in me. I came to the hospital thinking of the millions of people who've been killed in Ethiopia, the women who've been re raped, the country that's devastated, the economy that has been completely destroyed. With kind of a pessimistic view, I come to this hospital, and these nurses created new optimism in me. They are really human beings, which will do anything wash you, clean you, and I'm sure some of you who have been in the hospital have, have a feeling like that. So I'm very, very happy to say there are human beings that are like this, that are like saints, that are like angels. That is why I do not give up my, my, my commitment to peace, uh, and uh, I'll follow these nurses as my role models, while I cry day and night over the death and destruction of the country I loved very much. Um, I could uh, uh, speak much longer, but uh, both because I'm not so strong, <laughs> I'm sleepy, and because there's no time, I will stop here. And may God bless all the nurses of the world and all the people who do good like you, and people like you also, I'm quite sure, who are trying to do something good in the world, committed, because we need people like that. Otherwise, the world, in the Hebrew religion, says 36 people must exist, otherwise the world will be destroyed. And so, in spare Ethiopia, destruction of Ethiopia, there are 36 nurses I met. Thank you. So David and uh, Ephraim, thank you. You forgot to do the best part. So I'll do it for you. Students, there is a check, I believe, in your, um, so part of the program of Fellowship and Peace, I love this about their program, they insist that without a lot of qualifications, often when students receive money for a project, there's a lot of things they have to do to kind of document what they all did, and you do have to do some of that. But overall, Fellowship and Peace has awarded each MAP or Master of Arts in Peacebuilding student 
to use for their capstone projects to really help it be meaningful and to make a difference in their communities. And this is money that you don't actually have to report every dollar for. You just have to tell us generally what you're doing with it. Whatever you do, don't go and buy an iPhone. <laughs> Although Phoebe might argue it could really help in some places, so maybe you can. I don't know, but we just want you to know that Fellowship and Prayer have awarded you each $2,100 to use for your capstones. Thank you so much. <laughs> It is my honor to introduce, but first, um, before I introduce Sue Williams, who's here with us tonight, I just want to say a word about one of our beloved uh, trustees who has passed recently, and his name is Bang Williams. Um, I know him as Bang. There's a picture of Bang up there. Um, his full name is Elliot Williams, but we know him as Bang because he was born on the 4th of July. I have to believe that his name that went with him from childhood as Bang has made an impact on how he's looked at life. He was born with a Bang, and he lived with a Bang, um, and we know him as Bang. Uh, when he passed, and it was a sudden uh, passing, it, it, it struck us all so quickly and, and so harshly. Um, I wrote to our trustees, sorry Sue, I know you're gonna speak after this. Um, I wrote to our trustees, and I wrote it from the bottom of my heart. I don't know if I've met a more kind man than Bang Williams. I interviewed for this job, and he was part of the interviewing trustees at that time. And I told a little bit of my own story, which I'm not gonna tell too much of, but I'll just say that I have a bit of an interesting story. My parents adopted children from Bangladesh and from Laos when I was very young. So my earliest memory is in a very all-white kind of community in rural Ontario, Canada. As I like to say, there were 10 people in our town of 10,000 that weren't white, and four of them lived in my house. Um, you know, the other three ran a Chinese restaurant, and there was a, a but Bang took such an interest in my story, and then he proceeded to tell me his story, and it always had to be about his story of faith. And it was his story, his journey of faith, and then he told me about his journey to Iran with Dr. Shakibai, who is here, who he loves so dearly, and the journey that you had there. Thank you, Dr. Shakibai, for being here. Um, we're so honored that you, many of you tonight, are here to honor Bang Williams. You have made significant gifts in his honor for this program because Bang loved the peace building program. So I'm just delighted that you've come to honor Bang tonight through this night. I'd like to invite his widow, his wife, uh, Sue Williams. Would you like to come forward and just say a few words? so heartwarmed to see your smiling faces and uh, means a great deal. Joel has told you something of Bang being here. I want to tell you how Bang got here, his story, but I have to not take too much time. <laughs> in 1988, Bang and I went to South Africa on a plowshares immersion experience with Bob and Alice Evans. The group was made up of many ministers, teachers, librarians, social workers, therapists, and one sole businessman. That would be Elliot Penfield Williams, <laughs> AKA Bang. We participants were deeply moved and reshaped by the experience. But I think it would be safe to say that every cell of Bang Williams' body was completely transformed. That was the beginning of his life in service to diversity, justice, 
and peacemaking. He went on a plowshares trip almost every year after that to places like Haiti, China, Iran, India, Indonesia, and of course back to South Africa. If he wasn't doing plowshares, he was building homes for Habitat for Humanity all over the world. Then, uh, when he wasn't traveling, he was uh, taking courses here at the seminary, and then he became part of HIU. He couldn't get enough of learning about people, of other cultures, and other religions. He began reading voraciously about reli religious matters. He was a transformed man and loved to engage in profound discussions about anything spiritual or religious. Bang would be both flabbergasted and maybe even initially embarrassed about this scholarship in his name. He would also be profoundly humbled and quietly proud. I know he would have especially relished the opportunity to converse extensively with every recipient. Well, he can't do that now. And when I begin to grieve that realization, which would have been meant so much to him, I quickly go to the fact that Bang rests in the heart of God and God is always with us, so Bang is always with us. Bang will know every scholarship recipient intimately. All shall be well. I thank each of you for being part of this extraordinary endeavor here at HIU. Thanks. I believe we now have some music from Lena and Regina. Are you here? Yes, you are. Would you like to come forward? So before we sing our song, we would like to share a story from our song. In this opportunity, we will combine two folklore songs from Indonesia and Greece. And the theme of folklore song is about love. The Indonesian folklore song tell us about how um, a couple just know about love, know about each other, they still flattering, and about the Greek folklore song tell us about how sometimes people lose their love because of their ego and stubbornness. <laughs> For us, singing together from two different cultures and in two different languages is the sound of living all together in harmony with our differences. It is the sound of diversity and the work that Hartford International University does. Thank you.
give some information about MAP, look ahead to the next year of the program, and recognize folks who have been important sources of sustenance. Now, I love a good list. Lists are very useful, but they're not terribly interesting. Uh, and we promised you an evening of storytelling. So I'm gonna see if I can turn this list into something that has some storytelling elements to it. So here we go. Once upon a time, there was a graduate school that cared so much about religion and peace that we put it in the name. And this graduate school already had a peace program called the International Peacemaking Program, but it was for only a tiny number of students. It was fairly loosely organized, and it was not a full-fledged master's degree. So in 2020, when so much was changing, I was put in charge of making it bigger and better. And this is the action, the plot of our story. Now every good story needs some sort of conflict at its center. And we had conflict because what we wanted, a one year peace building master's degree program that was international, residential, interreligious, and experiential had never been done before. There were no models for it. It was uncharted territory. And while there are other programs that will combine one or two elements of that, no one else tries to do it all together, and certainly not in an accelerated master's program. And if that was not enough of a challenge, we had another conflict. We were gonna to try to pull this off in the middle of a global pandemic. <laughs> so it's a good thing we like a challenge. It's also a good thing that we know that conflict is normal and that peace building is about handling conflict well. It's also good that there are all sorts of protagonists in this story. Protagonists like faculty and staff who were up for this double challenge and committed to our new program, the Master of Arts in International Peace Building, as a hallmark of the religion and peace work we do here at HIU. And protagonists like students who are willing to leave everything they know behind to come be part of this new program. And I want you to think about that just for a moment. Imagine that, being so dedicated to peace that you're willing to leave your friends, your family, your job, your country, your language for a whole year to become a better peace builder. These students do that. They are remarkable people. And if every good story has conflict, every good story also has risk. Working for peace always involves risk because it means asking people to move away 
from old and familiar norms of division and build new and unfamiliar norms of collaboration. Building new norms is always risky work. It is always uncharted territory. We at HIU took the risk to build a new kind of program. And the students took the risk to be part of it right at the start. Many of you gathered in this room took the risk of supporting us in doing this. So we've got conflict and we've got risk. But thanks to all of these amazing protagonists, for our story so far, I've got to say so far so good. Because our second cohort is finishing up their year with capstone projects that will bring their new learning back to their home communities. And this involves a whole different type of risk. When they're here, they're engaging in experiential education. And one thing experiential education is really good at is modulating that interplay of safety and risk. Here, we ask them to try new ways of collaborating with the religious other in a community which is inherently supportive of that work. When they leave us, they take these new skills in mediation, dialogue, trauma healing, and restorative justice back to communities which are not inherently supportive. I listen to them talk about their projects, and I am inspired by their courage all over again. There are other protagonists in this story who are sometimes less visible day to day, but no less important. And this is you, our community of supporters. You are people and organizations who are dedicating time, effort, and money to making MAP a success. And I'm going to take a moment to name who you are, so you know with whom you are sharing this great venture and with whom you are sharing this evening. So first of all, a thank you to our big donors, those who are giving more than $20,000 annually. You've already heard from Fellowship and Prayer, who believe in the capstone work of our students. They give grants to each student to allow them to have resources to use for this peace-building work. The E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Foundation is a longtime supporter of HIU's peace-building mission. Over the years, their grants have often promoted diversity within the peace-building cohort by supporting the student who identifies as LGBTQ+. The Francis Asbury Palmer Foundation has long supported theological education. They've shown their belief in HIU's dedication to religion and peace by making a multi-year grant in support of the MAP program. Likewise, our anonymous donor has made a multi-year grant. These are private citizens, not a foundation, and they've been extremely generous in supporting scholarships for MAP students, and we thank them. The Pryor Family Foundation recognizes the importance of religious diversity in our program by offering scholarship support specifically for a Jewish student. David and Sarah Carson have been faithful supporters of peacebuilding work at HIU. They've given generously to the preceding peacebuilding program as well as the current master's degree. David and Sarah, thank you. Lynn and John Fulkerson have been steadfast in their support of our peacebuilding students. Many students over many years have benefited from their scholarship support. And to them, we say thank you as well. As you've heard, Bang Williams is a huge supporter of HRU and our peacebuilding work, and his friends and family have given generously to MAP in his memory. To the many of you here tonight, thank you for your support. Now, support comes in many forms. MAP has also benefited from the support of the board, which believes in the vision of this program. We are also immensely grateful for the involvement and support of our Hartford International Ambassadors, who showed up at orientation events to help this student cohort get their year off 
to a great start. You'll see some photos on the screen of several different events which were enriched by the participation of our ambassadors. We are also thankful to the First Church of West Hartford, who asked how they could help and, were, and willingly became a location for our students to practice new dialogue facilitation skills. We engaged in completely fascinating dialogues of how, about how religious values play out in everyday life. And you can see a couple photos here behind me. For every form of support, we are deeply grateful. The story of MAP is still in its early chapters. We have another cohort who will start in August. They're now making their way through the always difficult visa process. And fingers crossed, we look forward to welcoming students this coming August from Nigeria, Kenya, Tanzania, Zimbabwe, Cameroon, Ghana, Lebanon, India, Afghanistan, and the United States. Your support has made MAP possible so far. You are essential characters in this story. Thank you for believing in us. Thank you for taking this risk with us. And now I'm going to move us away from story and back to song. Today, one of our essential characters, Ambassador Shirley Dudley, is turning 90 years old. And so we need to sing to her. Uh, and so I'm going to invite Lena and Regina to come back up and start us off. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. the call. The call was um, about a meeting which was going to take place at the Ministry of Education. And they called me around 1.30 p.m. and I was told that the meeting was going to be at 2 p.m. <laughs> so when I received the call, this was a late call, and what they told me was that it was the meeting to address the issue which had resulted as a result of the conflict which was occurring in a district in Malawi over the headscarf. So what happened was that the Minister of Education issued a statement allowing Muslim girl children to put on their headscarves as part of the dress code. But this statement was not well received by several schools, including the schools which were run by the churches, the Catholic and the Anglican. So for the Muslim side, they were pushing that 
the custodian of the education, the minister of education has given the, us an allowance that we can wear our hijab. And you're saying that they cannot wear the hijab and you're returning them from school. Yeah, so after I received that call and I had a bit about the meeting, I said, this is the place that I wanna go. This is the course that I'm passionate about. So I agreed to go. And before that, I thought that, okay, let me also talk to other Muslim women who would join me and make a greater presence at this meeting. So I called them, especially the one I knew that they were likely to be in the city center. And every one of the women that I called, they said they were busy. This is a late call. And I realized I was going to be alone. Yeah, because I was already told that they needed a woman, meaning that they were all men. So I went there with my fears. This was the first big meeting. I've never appeared before the principal secretary of education. So yeah, I, I brought my courage and I said I was going to do it. We went there. We were ushered into the office of the principal secretary of education. It was an office that smelled power and authority. The most beautiful I've ever seen for, for my first time, because I've been to other government offices and you know, the furniture is old, but in this office, everything looked organized. And the principal secretary welcomed us and we started talking about the issues. And he began to tell us that, okay, we understand that our statement is causing tension, but we want you to keep calm. So what we are going to do is, we are going to issue another statement, but we want you not to take this out. It must not be in the public. Don't even take it to the media. Because if you do that, the Rastafarians also have issues with us. They want their children to come to school with their dreadlocks. So we don't want that. We're not ready for that. <laughs> so in that moment, a couple of things hit me. Okay, we are a minority. And they want us to also take part in causing the oppression to another group who is also oppressed. And then I looked around the room. I was alone, the only woman, Muslim. You know, when you're Muslim and a woman, that's a double jeopardy, double discrimination. <laughs> and I realized that this is not the reality only in this room, but also out there, it's like that. And in our discussions, I remember telling the, minister, the, the principal secretary that, you know, you have to at least intervene in the issue. You're the custodian. Because of this issue, violence escalated. You know, we saw the division of the community, Muslims and Christians fighting. And because you're not doing anything, you're having a responsibility on whatever is happening in this community. But when he said that, oh, don't take this to the public, Prior to this meeting, I was told that they shouldn't trust him because he goes back and forth. There were divisions within the ministry. And then I said, okay, maybe we can give him the benefit of the doubt, which we did. And at that moment, we, were try we, we, we had an automata saying that we were going to conduct some protest just to shame them. They're not doing anything. Maybe the public should know and be aware of what is happening. And then we went with the promise that they are going to do things better. But things did not change. And this resulted in the schools closing down. So the closure of these schools meant that about 2,500 students were out of school. And this is just after the pandemic. Fortunately enough, in Malawi, we did not face a lockdown, but schools closed temporarily. And we thought that during that closure, they were going to intervene on the issue and provide a solution. So it had to take um, interventions of other stakeholders like United Nations Development Fund, which funded a dialogue. And because I was involved in this meeting, when the men were planning on who to pick also to be part of the dialogue team, they thought about me. And I found myself there. So during the dialogue, 
we had several meetings with several partners, including, again, members from the Ministry of Education. And I remember Korean, one of the directors, told us, the Muslims, that please tell your children to leave their religion at home. And then after that, he proceeded to make a presentation on the history of education in Malawi. So in the history of education, we were told that education was introduced by the missionaries, and the aim initially was to evangelize. And we also had Bible knowledge, a subject specifically. Not only for Christians, Muslim, Christian, we all take the subject. And this man is telling us that we have to leave the religion at home. What, the, what is he talking about? That was causing confusion, and the room went dead silent. We were confused. We are here in a dialogue. We are hoping to understand each other, and already someone from the ministry is taking sides. Yeah. So it was a difficult process. I remember some days I dreaded attending the dialogue. As a team, we were making progress, but when we report to the leaderships that entrusted us with this duty, they would say, no, you're giving in too much. Why are you leaving out this issue? You're letting them win. So it was such a tough process, but in the end, we agreed and formed um, and, and um, came up with a memorandum of understanding, which changed the policy, gave a policy direction. Now, the schools, even those that are run by the churches, they said that we are no longer going to be retaining the Muslim girls from school, now they can wear the headscarf as part of the dress code. And we are also tasked with um, making recommendations on the policy on education. So this whole experience taught me two things which I'll mention now, that the religious community can be a resource for change, that we don't have to hate each other. And through this process, and coming here doing the MAP program, I realized that the acts of the Minister of Education were violence against the children of Malawi. So, and I remember both of us, Christian and Muslims, arguing that our children are losing, Christian and Muslim, because this school, Carter School, all of them. So if we're holding on to our positions that we cannot change, someone is winning, we are destroying their future. Yeah, so coming here, I realized a lot of things and uh, I've gained skills that I'm going to use to improve my work in Malawi. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laika. Next up is Harriet Ahalo, who's from the city of Mombasa on the coast of Kenya. It was a, bit, a beautiful Wednesday morning. The sun was shining brightly. Uh, it was a little bit unusual this day because um, April is a rainy season. And so I was excited to go to my internship at the Kenya Police Service, at Department of Criminal Investigations. I was 19 then, and I was the first intern ever uh, to work with the Kenya Police Service at the whole of coast region of Kenya. And um, so I leave the house, and then I go to uh, where I would take the ferry. And then after crossing, I take a public transport. Upon boarding, um, upon boarding, about uh, 10 minutes from bo after boarding, I witnessed a shooting. And uh, things happened so fast because Things happened so fast, and so the driver had to quickly drive fast to town. When I got to town, I walked about 100 meters, which is roughly 0 0.06 miles to the office. I get to the office, and uh, upon getting to the office, I meet my colleague, Emma. And so I start explaining to Emma this whole situation that I've witnessed when coming to the office. and. Um, this whole time, it hasn't really registered in my mind that someone lost their life. 
and uh, a few minutes later my colleague Michael comes in and then he asks me to join him to the scene of crime after when he talked to me I was really hesitant because I wasn't sure if I want to put myself in that situation and then um, I just leave the office and I go and board the police land cruiser we get to the scene of crime and then uh, you know, when I got there, I was really angry and I was really worried, my body was tensed because I have never witnessed a robbery with violence. I have never seen someone being shot at. And so we take the evidence and then from the CCTV footage, I see that it was a young man who had um, shot this man. This man was just an errant guy who had gone to um, take money for his organization. And so we leave the scene of crime with evidence and then we go back to the office to compile a report and also prepare for postmortem that was scheduled at 3 p.m. the same day. At 3 p.m., my colleague Michael comes back to the office and he asks me, Harriet, can you please go to the hospital where the postmortem is going to take place? I hesitate. And I asked him if I can, leave, I can stay back because I wasn't prepared. But then Michael declines my request and uh, he reminds me that I am an, I'm no longer an intern, that I'm now a police officer. And so we leave the, we leave the, uh, the office and then we get to the hospital. And then upon getting to Pandya Hospital, uh, I see the wife of the deceased, I see two of uh, the kids and also a relative and they were crying. You know when I saw them my eyes were filled with tears and um, as we were walking towards them I asked Michael if I can stay out of the postmortem room. But then Michael reminds me that I'm not an intern, I'm a police officer and so I need to act like one. And so hesitantly, we go to the postmortem room, and then the whole process was really hard uh, on me because I was asked to stand next to the wife, and then my colleague Mo Michael was standing opposite me. This whole time, I could hear the wife crying, and my eyes were just filled with tears. I wanted to just, you know, let out my emotions. And after the whole process we get out of the postmortem room and I ask Michael to take me to the jetty where I'll take the ferry and you know, get back home. But on our way, my dad calls me and then he informs me that he won't be coming home together with my brother. The, both of them are not going to come home. And so I'm going to be in the house alone. That night was really long. I didn't sleep. My body was cold. The trauma was too much for me. This is just an experience of what people in communities experience in their daily lives. Uh, no one is prepared to experience trauma. It just gets to you. From this difficult experience, I found myself in activities that involved healing communities. This also resulted to me founding an organization called We Rise Africa that champions for safe spaces for minority groups like young people and also women to discuss issues that affect them in daily lives. <coughs> By also tapping onto the local resources like faith leaders who are very important in the healing journey of communities. Being in HIU has provided me with the opportunity to learn about trauma, to learn about the triggers of trauma, to learn about restorative justice, but most importantly, to initiate peace building initiatives in a trauma informed way. <clears throat> I have deep sense of gratitude to you for your contribution to the mission of HIU, which is why I am here today. It is also why I feel ready to go back to the community back in Kenya, my home country, and contribute to healing communities with a lot of empathy with a lot of compassion, and also working in the foundation of one of HIU's values, and I'm going to quote, 
We believe in education that is transformative, creative, empowering, and enabling people to contribute more fully to their faith-based civil, civic communities. Thank you. Thank you, Harriet. Our final storyteller tonight is Minoto, who's from India and from a very specific part of India. He's from the state of Nagaland, which shares a border with Myanmar. Twenty eighteen, back in India, I am in a room with 26 other students with two professors. The professor says, share your topic for your master's thesis. One after the other, the students are sharing their topic. And now it is my turn to share my tentative topic. I said, sir, I wanted to look at the issues related to the indigenous community called Naga in Indo-Myanmar borderland. My professor said, Vinito, that is too much for your master's program because of time constraint. I insisted and decided to carry on. I particularly wanted to look at this region because my people, a Naga community, we have a, we have a political conflict with the government of India since Indian independence. This led to implementation of AFSPA in my state, in our region, Armed Force Special Power Act, which led to gun violence and bloodshed over this last 70 years. Now, I have decided to go in a region, in an area, which is one of the most dangerous areas in the region because of the presence of different military regimes. On one side, you see mili Burmese military. In between, you see Naga insurgency group and the other side, Indian military. A place also known for gun violence and bloodshed. But I still do not know anyone in the border area, nor have I been there. I quickly contacted three of my friends to help me to get in touch with a pastor who knows a person in the border area. And the pastor connected me to a person called Cheno, who helped me with my master's thesis in data collection. For months, I kept in touch with Cheno, and finally, May 2018, third week of May, I left my hometown. I went to a small town called Mon. I slept there for a night, and the next day, Cheno and I, we got all our groceries for nine, 10 days, and now, where we are heading towards border. Bumpy roads, bumpy right, I finally reached the border between India and Myanmar. As soon as I reached there, I meet two persons, two men and a lady who is waiting for us to carry the food items back to the village. All set to go now, but just before we entered the border, border of Myanmar, I called up my mom and I told her, I am leaving now, I won't have a phone network, wait for my call until Saturday. I took my bag and we started, I entered the forest and we started to walk along with others in, on a small narrow road. And it was during monsoon season, it was drizzling. I can hear the rain hitting the leaves. I can hear, as I walk through the forest, I can hear the birds and insects. I can hear the gunshot, probably hunting. Knowing the history around that region, every time, every step I take, although I was excited, I am nervous, I am anxious, I am a little worried, wondering what is going to be, what is going to be next, what is, what is the next step. After working for almost an hour, we stopped by to take rest in a place which was initially the first check-get of insurgency group 
before they had the gun exchange with Indian military. It took us two hours to walk in the forest and reach the village. As soon as I reached the village, we reached the village, Cheno told me, by now, military regimes from both sides would have known that you are in this village. I am now standing in a place, in a small village, surrounded by mountains and forests where there is no transportation, where there is no electricity, where there is no phone network. Completely different world. We eat rice before they go to farm early in the morning and that was our breakfast and our lunch around 7 a.m. By evening, before it gets dark, by 6 o'clock, we eat our dinner. Or if we happen to eat around 6.37, we carry a torch in one hand, we eat with other hand. Or we sit around the fire. I completed my data collection as prepared. But lo and behold, I couldn't go back on Saturday. My parents, they are getting worried by now. They are trying to get contacts with different people to ask about my stay. Finally, I left the village early morning at 6 a.m. the following week on Monday. On our way back to the border, the Indian border, we met few villagers who told us that the Indian army, the Assam Rifle paramilitary, which is part of Indian army, they are patrolling around that region. As soon as I heard that, I got nervous and I was worried. My friend Cheno told me, if if Indian Army, if they ask you, just tell them you were here for two, three days. But I know for sure that they are keeping track of us. And what if they know that I, I lie? I will be in trouble. We reached the village, the border area, around 8 a.m. So as soon as I reached there, I tried to locate the phone network, and I called up my parents. It was a big relief for them. The only thing they told me was, we were worried about you because you told us that you will be back by Saturday. I went back home, I submitted my data collection, I completed my master thesis. Two things that still concerns me from these experiences. First, during the interview, one of the respondents told me, we seek and long for peace in the border areas. We don't want our children to experience what we have experienced. Second, Cheno told me, when you go back, write, share, and tell people about our struggles and experiences in the border areas. Since then, everywhere I go, I share about them. I share about the story in the local context, in the national context. And today, because of the opportunity that I got through your support, I share the story in this international setting. Who could have known that small, that little moment in the border areas would have led me today in peace building? Since I left that place, I had an urge to go back and contribute my service to them. However, I do not know how to start, where to start, and what to do exactly. But today I stand here with my head held high, proudly saying that I am trained by different professionals and practitioners through this MAP program. After this one year of rigorous training here at HIU, I am now one step ahead. This MAP program gave me the holistic understanding of peace building. And now I am ready to put my patience and the knowledge that I've gained here together and look forward to peace building in the border areas. Without your constant support, this young man would have not stood here today. I wholeheartedly express my gratitude and once again remind you all that your generous support in different ways is impacting the other side of the world that you have never, that you have not even heard of. Thank you. Inspiration. I think it would have been safe. <laughs>
So thank you so much to all of our storytellers. Uh, I'm now gonna hand it once more back to Lena and Regina, who are gonna lead us in a final sing-along. So for this song, we will need your help. <laughs> but first, Regina and I, we will sing the verses one, so you will have an idea about the melody. And you can join us too while we rehearse the song. So let us rehearse first. <laughs> I've got peace like a river, I got peace like a river, I got peace like a river in my soul. I've got peace like a river, I got peace like a river, I got So we will separate all of you into two groups. So the first group will be Mr. David table, Paul table, Finos table. Please your, raise your hand. Okay. And then Phoebe's table will be the first group okay. and will be led by Lena. And then the rest of the table and this group. My king, <laughs> Marina's table and my table will be led by me and focus on me. <laughs> so group one, can I see your hands? <laughs> okay, we're good. So <laughs> we start first. One, two, three. I've got peace. I've like got a peace river. like a river. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river in my soul. joy like a fountain I've got joy like a fountain I've got joy like a fountain in my soul I've got joy like a fountain I've got joy like a fountain I've got joy At its best. I'm Katie O'Leary and I'm the Director of Engagement and I would love at this point to chime in with my thanks and uh, thank you so much to Phoebe and to the wonderful students for so beautifully connecting all of us to this important peace building work through stories and through song. Thank you very much.
And thank you to all of you for all of the many, many ways that you support this work. It is so important and we are so grateful. I hope that you will leave here, we hope that you will leave here tonight with, with uh, your hearts full, knowing that you are making an incredible difference across the globe and in ways that you will likely never even know. And when you think about it, this kind of work, this peace building, that's the beauty of it. If it's done well, we don't know. Because at the grassroots level, flames are extinguished before fire, you know, wildfires start. So that's what you are part of tonight. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And good night. Thank you.